Uh, good evening to each one of you, our dear, dear Heavenly Father's children. Well, good to you, whatever it is at this um, uh, viewing time, the day, the night, uh, but a good portion of this presentation to you today titled The Ministry of Restoration a biblical, Afrocentric or Afrocentric view of the prodigal son as it rises from Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 24. This is our first submission and uh, we're looking forward to having the second submission subsequently. Um, part of our African American History Month presentation. This is a long one, y'all. I, I couldn't do all of this in one uh, sharing. Plus, I didn't want to bore you with uh, this uh, attempt of um, uh, theological astuteness. <laughs> but I wanted to uh, pattern it after a great um, bit of some uh, of a thought and uh, then to provoke even more thought relative to this very important discussion relative to the African-American male here during 2019, uh, 2021, 2021. Yeah, I have a uh, PPP on my mind from 2019 and, and the real uh, harrowing year of 2020 and uh, moving now into the afterglow of such for 2021. Uh, wanted to handle this word um, as best as we could in such a reflective vein. Oh Father we pray your blessings, your choice blessings as you have made space for us to share Bless this sharing that some brother, some, some wife, some mama, some daddy, some brother that wishes for their, their sibling, their son um, would come to a new light uh, of themselves in this very volatile time of living. We pray, we, 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 we settle our prayers as undergirding these themes in, in this attempt to pull from the old and um, uh, sprinkle in the midst of uh, a new season, a new day, a new future. Hear our prayer, incline thine ear unto us and grant us Thy peace in the name of Jesus our Christ and our Lord. The ministry of restoration, a biblical Afrocentric view of the prodigal son. This we share from our book, Lessons in Family Development, moving forward by going back to the basics. Uh, this can be obtained from us out of our bookstore um, for $18.95 and um, it is a, a great sharing. It's a great sharing. Uh, it, it came from us dealing with our own men in our own setting and then uh, pulling uh, other um, um, informative voices to help uh, chart a path for our for our men and our young adults that we'll be addressing here. These areas, there are four areas we'll be addressing in this segment, four areas. An ideal father, uh, the weighing of maturity, uh, wisdom, and patience is the third and fourth. We'll take a look at uh, the far country. 
many expositions and homilies have been offered concerning the biblical story of the prodigal son. In this inspirational investigation, we hope to look at this story and see what wholeness qualities can be derived for the African-American male. I, much, I must submit <laughs> this look at the African-American male is timely as well as needy. Time is being spent in this work to help the male in general and the African-American male in particular take a critical look at himself. Whether this is a male thing, I will let you decide. With penetrating insight, Paul Hill in his book, Coming of Age, African American male rights of passage has categorized the African American male's existence to be a uh, in at best an endangered species. But not only is this a male problem, it also has implications for the family of that male. Hill further surmises when the well-being of African American males is threatened the entire African American community is at risk. An overview of the African American male's image is helpful to understand this endangered species label. Black men were stolen from Africa as whole people with a strong self-concept, cultural competence, high self-esteem, positive behavior, and group loyalty. However, through physical enslavement, and current chains, and images of psychological enslavement, many black men are now fragmented and fractured males characterized by a confused self-concept, cultural incompetence, ambivalent behavior, depreciated character, adaptive behavior, confused group loyalty, and reactionary behavior. And as psychologist Nayam Akbar says in his book, Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery, the historical image which we have inherited continue to sabotage many of our efforts for true manhood and womanhood. And while we look at this theme, we look with some regret, some apprehension, but with a new day for African American men in focus. While we will be concerned with the culture in which the African-American male has lived in and is living in, we believe that the Bible, a cultural informer, can inform one how to live with proper perspective. And it is our hope that the reader the listener will draw helpful principles and conclusions which will help him be a better person. The anger, 
the rage, the emotional trauma that many Africans deal with. We deal with even the distasteful, distasteful, identified and decontrolled once this work has been critically considered decontrolled, to be decontrolled and to obtain a new control to work through this area of growth and development in order that we land on our feet and chart a path step by step to regain a new health and a new healthiness for our men in our days ahead. It is our prayer that we can help mold a whole new spiritual cultural dimension for the African American male. African American females have stock in this new dimension for the African American male because if the male can come to a clearer sense of self, biblically speaking, the female can obtain a better grasp upon life and living. And this will do much for wholeness, returning to our families, rebuilding our communities, and returning to our Creator God, His Son, and our elder brother, Jesus, as well as being guided in the proper living practices informed by the Holy Spirit and the empowering Word of God. So first here, consider with me this ministry of restoration, for it is an old story which is being lived today for you and for me for my sons, for those I pastor, and for those who long for a fresh way out of an old story. Let's look first at an ideal father. An ideal father. What about the father image in this story? We investigated some helpful principles are apparent which can afford us with some sound ethical merits and explicit teaching of this ideal father. Historically, this parable was one of three used by Jesus to express the theme of losing that which is precious and need it. Then we also uh, deal with the lack of religious concern for the despised of the community. Uh, that one, that father here is under condemnation because of his expressions of concern for them, the son who stayed home and the son who left home. Uh, and we see dad here accused of receiving and eating with sinners. Uh, so is Jesus <laughs> the dad in this text seen receiving and eating with sinners. A view of the parables find Jesus talking about a lost sheep and expressed the joy of finding it. Verses 4 through 7. He moves into a house with the parable and talks about a woman who lost a coin and the joy expressed when she found it. Verses 8 through 10. 
Then we come to the third story as Jesus lifts before us the measure of human worth in verses 11 through 32. Though this parable is filled with cultural, moral, and ethical undertones, the value of patience is an overarching theme that we wish to highlight. Patience. Uh, maintaining hope against all odds is the ethic of an ideal father being expressed for the impatience of a younger son and the lack of patience by an elder son. In this trilogy of human paradoxes, we find that uh, attitudes of a father whose standard is that of God and whose action should be incorporated and accentuated by every father is the image before us today. The text says a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Uh, so he divided to them his livelihood. Sonship is a cherished position or right to have in any family. It is sacred and should be treated as such. Sons should want to emulate the best that they have received from their father and not to be torn from the paternal leg of that father too soon. The son in this text is emotionally at this point of departure. He should be in a teenager, could be in a young adult, maybe who who feels the yearning to leave home, to taste of the offerings of life outside of the home, and fail in some regard to take into a far country what was learned in the home. He could be yearning to leave home, to taste of the offerings of life. He feels he has been under the roof and under the tutelage of daddy long enough. So now he finds that he can handle what life has to offer. Now there is a day for such an exit from the home of dad from dad's direct authority, from dad's supervision. But when that day comes, must be determined by the weighing of maturity and the teachings of wisdom, which are outgrowths of patience. The weighing of maturity. How mature was this younger son? The level of his maturity was observed by his father. From the father's observation, the boy was either mature enough to handle the far country he was about to embark upon or was willing to give his son a chance to see what the real world was all about on his own. 
When does a parent become prepared to comfort or find comfort and confront such a situation? Is there a measuring stick that came with being a dad for this parenting time? Is, is dad in possession of that measuring stick that uh, he's supposed to pull out of his back pocket now and say, what am I about to do? Uh, are we making the preparation from the day of birth and giving tasks of responsibility throughout the growing days of our children? How do we measure maturity? Maturity is learned. The legend of the eagle training the young eagles to fly is helpful here. The eagle builds its nest in high mountainous areas. They construct the nest or construct the nest with both soft and uncomfortable materials such as grass and thorns. In the early stages of growth of the eagle, the grass provides a warm place of abode while under the wings of the mother eagle, that warmth nurtures that eagle in training. In the early stages of growth of the eagle, the grass provides a warm place of abode while under the wings of the mother ego, there is a mothering place. But as growth takes place, as growth takes place, as growth takes place, the grass is picked out by the mother until the thorns begin to stick through. The thorns make it difficult for comfort. Knowing this, the mother eagle makes it a convenient time to train the young eagles to fly up in the mountains. The mother eagle perches the young one by one on the side of the nest. There is a nudge, nudges them until they are over the edge and helps the young eagle come to know the use of their wings. Wing use was not learned immediately, but time and time again from the nudging over the side of the nest by the mother eagle nurture and instinct provide understanding. One key parental variable is operative throughout this training process just before the young ego fell to their death from this high elevation in the mountain, the mother ego was always there to bear them back up with her strong wings. The more the young eagle was able to see the wings of the parents were there a new knowledge of their own wings. This was the same lesson taught by God to the children of Israel. He says in Deuteronomy 32, 11, 12, As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, 
taketh them, bearing them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead them, and there was no strange God with them. Since maturity has to be learned, the father provided the son with something he thought he could learn with the portion of good the young man asked for was what he um, what he was given he though could make it without or could he have only that to make it to make it to make it the father knew better Father must always know better. Could it be that the father had had the grass pulled from his nest at an early age and was made to gain maturity in flight? Could it have been that this father had been eager to let the eager children Learn the consequences of being too eager, too eager without everything they needed. How do you gain maturity? Could it have been that this father had seen eagle sons leave the home of neighbors and heard of the stories of their learnings? I would strongly suggest to you that this father had thought about this day, the day when his son will want to pull up stakes and venture away from home. The portion of goods entailed property and money. The usual custom was for property to be divided among the sons after the death of the father and in accordance with his last will, property could be settled on children as a gift. However, during the life of the parent, so they then had no further claim to the family possessions. Usually the profits from property so acquired would begin to go to the beneficiary only after the death of the father. So in this case, the son acquired the right to exchange his property immediately for negotiated wealth. But was he really asking daddy to die? die to being over me, die to wanting me to just let you determine when I leave or not. Die, 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 dad, and let me move on. In the story, the father was able to give the son what was due him at the time of his death, and that is die. When, when sons or when uh, those they've been nurturing want to move from under that steady hand of care to an unsteady wondering if they are ready in this story, the daddy, the father was able to give the son what was due him when he died. So when daddy died, an early death or a death because of departure, um, he had second thoughts, but he wanted his son to learn. In many instances, the African-American male's portions of good is far less than is portrayed in this text. However, whatever the portion, it becomes the substance for the start. 
an old car, some gas money, a phone call placed in and pla placed in wearation <laughs> placed to someone who may be able to help us out open some door and meet someone in some key position the old adage can you put a word in for me it's been the portion most of us have had to rely upon in too many instances and in many instances, this has been all we needed. I remember seeing the commercial on television about a family gathering to celebrate the birth of the first grandchild in that family, the father of the new father, the father of the new father, the father of the new father, pulls the young man to the side and gives him an envelope. In that envelope, there was the gift for the new addition to the family. The young father tries to resist, saying that everything is all right. But the grandfather insisted, clarifies the reasoning of this envelope gift. He says, in substance, take this $5,000 and get your son's future started. Started, started. My father's father did it for me, and now I must do it for my grandson, and you must be prepared to do it for yours. There is much wisdom in such a practice Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Here we have what we could call a family being endowed, perpetually being taken care of generationally. Here the money that will patiently grow to help the son or daughter be in a unique position to get started right when their time comes is presented. And of course, maturity must be matched with the proper use of the money or you will have a prodigal or a reckless one on your hands. So we need patience and we also need wisdom. I'm sure you have heard or experienced like father, like son, possibly uh, with first hand knowledge, this father provides his son with the portion he understood then. This portion would be used to help open the other doors he did not know would be opened. The father valued his son's life so much that he allowed him to get out into life and experience it. Experience it for himself. He did not cut the cord of love, however, but allowed him to get out into life and experience the other side of the cord of love. The father did not try to live the son's life for him, but gave him the necessary let me see for myself space to learn. Learning space is provided by the love of parents and the level of maturity they have. It is very difficult to surmise that this, this father could let his son leave if he was not in touch with himself. He had reached the level of maturity. 
which could enable him to endure a temporary absence of his son. The threat of life posed an additional concern, and I believe Dad prayed on a day-to-day -day basis. Learning space is conditioned by the teachings through experience. Wisdom, which comes from God, cannot be acquired from the sideline of life. It must be gained from participation and use. You have to participate in the corridors of living to acquaint yourself with it and experience what it provides in order to understand it. One who has been under the influence of wisdom knows that it teaches you as you experience its influence. Wisdom teaches one patience. We have here a mature father who allows his not totally mature son to learn wisdom's teachings and what patience has to provide. We also have a father who knows something about patience, but who has to learn more about it by letting his son go into the far country. So at best, we have a dual learning experience right here before us. No parent is a professional. We are always in the practice of parenting. And the practice of parenting helps us to acquire lessons of understanding. We learn the value of parenting through patience and how valuable parenting is for our children. Value is measured in two ways in this story. First, intangible goods given. And secondly, in granting permission to leave. To leave. How valuable that decision of the father was. And it can only be determined through the actions and response of the son, then how does that decision play itself out for the remainder of the family? We will see how the older son responds in verses 25 through 32. But the cultural tradition mentioned earlier references the father having to die to make the request or the petitions of the son a reality. But does the father die? I suggest a part of him did suffer a kind of parental death when the son makes the request as, as much as one tries to prepare for days like this, it always seems to cause a certain death. I think we can best describe parental death to mean the unwanted confrontation with letting go. We wonder if the child is prepared, ready to get out from under our immediate protection and venture out into the untried regions of the unpredictable for themselves. Whether that child is aggressive, a late bloomer, naive, or with some street wisdom, we yet wonder if they are ready. The day most dreaded Finally, 
arrived. Verse 13 says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. A father-son sharing was had. Could a resurrection come to his father? How much liberation did the young man feel at such a time? The younger man had heard of the future. The father had experience from the past to pass on. And in the medium of the practice of it all was this bonding about to be extended into a realm where no real test had been provided. A unique twist to this departure was that this son is the younger son, the baby. He would usually leave home later after the older brother, but now he being the last one leaves first. Had he been a spoiled child? You know how most younger children benefit from some of the corrections of the parents. And parents try to make, make up from their learnings with their first children. Could some of the seeming failures of dad contribute to the uncontest freedom he gives his younger son? Or is it that he has faith in his son to do the right thing and able to handle life as it comes because he has poured his best into his younger man. Every father must do all they can to bring their children up with the best they can provide. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, how is the training tested? As the text suggests, only when the child enters in the way he should go. Such a time has come for this dad, and I believe he does not cherish the reality of his baby boy leaving. Did he worry? Second, think himself. Wondered if he had made the right decision to grant the request of his baby boy. Did he even go so far as to question his own fitness as a father, knowing how many possible pitfalls awaited his son? Did he hate himself for letting this happen too soon? The father possibly pondered, will he make it? Or will bad news come back to me before my son does? This kind of searching is not doubt, but only examination born out of loving concern. Did I make the right decision? Is this what's on your mind? So did, did the boy leave with a clear head and daddy's head clear as well? He ventures out into a far country. Verse 13 says, And they're wasted. Oh my God, his substance, all that daddy had given him, that, that portion, wasted it 
with riotous living. What is this far country the African American male must enter? Hill suggests the nature of American society has traumatized African American males. Not only has the environment contributed to the physical death of many African American males, it has also contributed to the psychological death of many more. Two literary classics that characterize the effects of American society on African American males are Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and Richard Wright's Native Son. The socioeconomic institutions of the American society has developed techniques for systematically making a large percentage of African American males useless in fulfilling their family obligations. African American males have had a difficult time protecting themselves from the pressures of major institutions in society. These institutions have resulted in negative consequences for family relationships in African American communities. In order to cope and survive in this environment, it has become necessary for human beings to react through adaptation. We sing from the outside, black lives matter. From the inside, such strength of words fails sometimes because everybody will not let black lives matter. They matter only when they are dead. And this devalued status precipitates a burden in dads and moms and granddaddies and grandmamas and brothers and in sisters and now in communities. However, the evolution of the adaptive process to insulate the African-American male population from the consequences of societal stress has created a catch-22 effect. The adaptation to one aspect of the environment has precluded his effective utilization of other aspects of the environment which are essential sources of sustenance. And this adaptive process has resulted in increasing insulation and isolation in personal social interactions. Alienation from those institutions and affiliations which have traditionally provided stabilizing points of reference and diminished faith in nature, community, family, authority, and in oneself as continuing influential forces. And the protective adaptation of the Amer African American male personality to the rigors of the increasing oppressive social environment has resulted in his isolation from essential sources of support for personal and spiritual survival. How can African Americans male live in the midst of a non-respectful community? When it comes to explaining why the African American male is removed from the civilian population at a much higher rate than that of the non-black counterparts, many sociologists and psychologists argue that it is the direct result of years of negative socialization. 
America has always defined the male role as that of predator and provider. But for a number of reasons, the African American male is frequently incapable of playing that role. While he may understand that racism is frequently the cause of his failure, the African American male's structural inability to play his role can take a psychological toll and may lead to violence, resisting, and falling under the weight of an oppressive law system. What has to be dealt with? Recent statistics published by one of our local papers, the Virginian Pilot, reflected upon violent crime comparisons out of the area's seven cities. Four experienced rise in homicides, rapes, robbery, aggravated assaults, pinpointing African American male statistics. The criminal populations are the the predominant ones. The latest funerals that I have had as a pastor have been for young African American males and one African American female who was killed by a stray bullet from crossfire between African American males involved. The church is packed capacity on these grief-stricken services, but one of the most deficient segments within our church population are those between the ages of 16 to 25 years old. It is sad that the only time the predominant number of them come to church now only at deaths and the funerals of their friends. The very fabric of America is being torn to shreds and black America's fabric is almost non-existent. It's a wonder we are as strong as we are with our strength lying in coffins. Riotous living in the prodigal's life could be attributed to his immaturity or the immaturity of the community he's dwelling in, the suspicion and his apparent strength. For if he leaves this center where influential prominence may aggressively handle him to an extent where we will degrade his strength or put him in a grave. Such tension rises and in too many instances prevail. Andrew Billingsley in his book Climbing Jacob's Ladder the enduring legacy of African-American families provides insight into the far country experience of African-Americans in America. He says, and go back a little bit, way back down, down, down south in 1965 in the Monaghan Report when he observed the Negro family, the case for national action. He, he provided a thesis and it seemed to reinforce the policy perspective that there was less need for changing the structure of society, less need for civil rights legislation and affirmative action, and more need for changing the internal structure of African American families by putting a man in charge of every house. We argued along with others that Monaghan had it all backward. We, we argued that society makes families 
and that it was the difficulties experienced by African Americans in the wider society, their economics, their political, and their educational deprivation, which caused the patterns of instability within families that Monaghan identified. Consequently, we argued that by changing the structure of, of social institutions so that they would function as well as blacks as they do for whites and as well for female-headed families as they do for male-headed families and as well for poor families as they do for more privileged families both family stability and more effective family functioning would follow. And after reflecting on these two decades of research in the, in the social sciences, since then we would now state our position somewhat differently, however, to avoid the either or mode of thought, we propose that families make society and society make families. We add to that observation, however, the view that while the influence between families and society flows in both directions, society has the advantage. This in part because society is older, larger, stronger, more continuous, and thus more powerful, and has more resources at its command. Oh, while it's snowing in Texas, you're going to take a side trip when you've already lied that your daughter wanted you to go to Cancun? Would that, would that, would that be a, an experience for an African-American male? <laughs> Come on, Senator Cruz. Though contemporary analysis of African-American families still have some difficulty with the idea of the supremacy of society over families, this proposition is really not new. Aristotle <laughs> expressed it this way, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual since the whole is of necessity prior to the part that's in politics page 60 that's some of my political science <laughs> and also some of my some of my uh, elevated uh, theological training it is an idea which can help us all understand better both the structure and the functioning of contemporary african american families as these Intimate associations struggle to help their members adapt to the pressures and opportunities inherent in their communities and their larger society. The so-called black family is not of their own making, nor is it the worst crisis they ever faced and survived. The so-called black families are made through their community alignment. And we face what we have to face as individual families. But Big Mama, Big Daddy, help us survive the test. Whether it is crime, poverty, drugs, divorce, racism, abortion, child abuse, social injustice, domestic abuse, hunger, immorality, gains, homelessness, teen pregnancy. The worst crisis has not arrived yet. And like Billingsley, I believe we can survive it. This resilience of or this resilience of strength must be passed on
to the African American male. He has weathered the far country historically and contemporarily he is and will be equipped to deal with it. Earlier we addressed the mature theme Walter McCray in his book Black Young Adults How to Reach Them What to Teach Them suggests nine signs of maturity which could become criteria for recognizing an emergent African American youth adult. And that's where we're going to pick up next. I've been with you an hour, uh, so uh, I'll give you a break. We'll uh, enter the second hour of our interaction here uh, with this um, import of uh, the Ministry of Restoration and Biblical Afrocentric view of the prodigal son. In our next hour we get together, we'll look at a test of the emerging African American young adult. Stay tuned y'all, it's going to be a unique experience. I thank you for this time of sharing and I do want to, want to say again, it's from some of uh, what we've been digging through. Lessons in family development moving forward by going back to the basics. Going back to the basics. Um, getting in the book and seeing how the books speak to us um, as African Americans. As African Americans. Father, we pray that this portion of the examination shall help us to pull upon the word as it informs. That we will not be neglectful, but that we will be gainful because of your wisdom for such a day ahead. In the name of thy Son, our Savior, and our role model, we pray. And all the people of God said amen and amen. See you shortly with part two. God bless.